we're starting a new series, God Works with Broken Families. Robin Diamond does our graphics, and we're very grateful for Robin to do that. But we, sometimes we look on the internet, try to get ideas, and a lot of the ideas with broken families, they're like torn in half families. And we're like, yeah, that's a broken family, but that's, that's only one subset of the broken families. We need a different look to broken families. And so she came up with this look because God works with broken families because they're the only families that are available for God to work with. Every family is a broken family because they're all made up of broken individuals. And so we're going to be looking and seeing how God blessed the whole world through some broken families. And we're going to be working in Genesis. Last year we covered kind of through the end of Abraham and Sarah's relationship. And now we're going to be looking at Abraham's son and his family and then the families after that and see how God works to bring blessing. In our family, we have six girls and two boys, and uh, we uh, were gifted from our son-in-law, uh, Roku, a couple years ago, which totally transformed our old TV. It's like now I don't have to watch me TV to see something different. It's like there's, there's all these channels that, that became available, and then um, other son-in-laws have come along or boyfriends and uh, it's like we just have so many subscriptions to streaming services somehow they get put on our Roku that I can't believe like all the things we can get to and then once in a while you know a boyfriend will break up and we lose a streaming service and that's sad <laughs> but uh, I was watching with six girls I don't watch a lot of sports but I was I was watching recently repeat episodes of um, love at first sight. And uh, this is kind of a weird premise for a reality TV show is that these people, they have these experts go and look for a spouse for them, uh, so a husband or wife for them, and then they match them up and they, they, they have them meet them at the altar. Like that's the first time they see them and they share their vows and that, that's it. Like, you know, see how it works out. And, and as I'm watching it, uh, my daughter, she's looking, since these are old episodes, she's looking on the internet, to, you know, on her phone to see, like, how did it work out? Oh, they're still together, you know, they have a couple kids, or like, oh, no, these guys <laughs> didn't work out. And uh, it's like, oh, that, that, that's kind of interesting. Well, the couple that we're looking at today in, in Scripture, they had that experience. They were a love at first sight couple, so they, they never met until they were married, uh, Isaac's dad, Abraham, sent his servant to go find somebody from his family that, that would uh, be a good wife for his son. And so the servant went, and we um, looked at that last year. It's an amazing story. You can read it. God you know, made this match in heaven, and so they, they got the right people, and she comes, and she covers up, and he's out in the field, and they meet each other, and they go to the tent, and um, that's it. Married, and then kind of going on, and it's like, how's it working out? And so we're going to be looking and seeing, you know, how's it work out? for this family, Isaac and Rebecca. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 25. And uh, we're starting in verse 19. It says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. And in Genesis, whenever you have that, this is the account of it, kind of clues you in from the author, like now we're working on a new uh, story. He's got several times that he used that. This is the account of, and this is the account of Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padanaram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Some people are kind of concerned that marriage ages are going up in our society. Hey, you know, 40. He, he, he didn't jump to the um, altar too soon. And uh, keep in mind that he's 40 as we start to see how this is working out for them. Verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was childless. Um, this is the evidence of brokenness. I mean, when, when people want children and they can't have them, like we were designed to be able to have children. And, and when, when you can't, that, that's brokenness and it's painful. And maybe some of you have experienced that. Maybe some of you are, are still experiencing that. But that's the experience that, that they're having. And where do we go when we're experiencing brokenness? 
in our family, just the brokenness that's in this world. And Isaac is a model for us. He, he goes to the Lord. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. I, I wish that everybody that prayed to the Lord because they're childless would have that answer. But not everybody gets that answer. It's still, the Lord's the only one that can meet you in that place. He can bring consolation. He can bring purpose, you know. Sometimes he'll bring children. And I think it's important to realize that uh, Isaac was 40 years old when they got married. And we'll see how old he is when these children come along. So it, it's like next sentence, you know, is the answer in here. But that sentence, there seems like there's quite a bit of space between the period of the first sentence and the period of the answer sentence. The babies jostled each other within her. Just stop right there. Jostled is kind of a playful word. But the, I, I was interested to see the translation of this Hebrew word could be a lot less playful. It could be mistreat, oppress, shatter, smash, smite, strike down, this is a foreshadowing of the kind of relationship that, that's going to happen between these two boys. And uh, babies, you know, it's kind of always a surprise if you're pregnant and it's like the baby, nope, babies. So the babies are jostling within her. So it's got, she got a couple surprises going on. She's trying to sort this out. Why is this happening to me? And so when she's trying to figure out why is this happening to me, this, what's going on inside me? She went to inquire of the Lord. And so you see Isaac, you know, seeking an answer from the Lord. Rebecca, inquiring of the Lord. These are good models for us. Like, this is what we need to do in our brokenness, is we need to be asking the Lord to help us. We need to be inquiring, getting guidance, like what's going on in our world. And God answers her. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. Like the first two lines are a sign of God's blessing that uh, there's going to be nations out of these boys, peoples. But now it's moving into the brokenness. They'll be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. And uh, notice that this inquiry, this is given to Rebecca. It might inform some of her decisions later on. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Harry, or Esau. And, uh, and after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Supplanter, Trickster, or Jacob. And uh, he, he does a good job of living into his name. You know, names have power. Uh, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So like 20 years, they're, they're waiting for God to answer. And God answers with these two boys. And, and he creates this family out of their brokenness. And, and God works through brokenness to create families, even to create nations, as he did here. Jesus was in a family that the Lord had to bring together. Things were not looking good for um, Jesus' parents or his stepdad and his mom. Matthew 1, 18 and 19 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, she knows she's pregnant through the Holy Spirit, but Joseph is not surprisingly having a hard time accepting that reality. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And like, this family is not going to happen. And God speaks to him through an angel and says, hey, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. And so God brings Jesus' family uh, together. Some people, you know, have it all planned out. Like, this is how it's going to go. I'm going to, you know marry this person, this kind of person, I'm going to get married at this age, and then we're either not going to have children, or we are going to have children, and when we have children, we're going to have them at this time, and this is how many, and this is what genders, and it's like, 
sometimes it goes as planned. Hey, wonderful. Oftentimes it does not go as planned. Like things just don't work out the, the way we plan. Sometimes we experience brokenness in, in this. And God is able to meet us in that brokenness. Maybe you really want to be in a family with someone and you're still single and you're like, ah, you know, don't give up on God. Take your request to him, stay obedient to him and, and trust him in this. And he'll either give you, you know, a husband or a wife or a better life than you would have with them. Some people, maybe you are in a marriage and you're like, I wish I would have waited. And now you wish you weren't in this marriage. Seek the Lord. Honor him. He can change you. He can change your spouse. You can't, but he can. He can change your marriage. Maybe you're longing for children. Seek the Lord. This is his area. The, the message is the Lord. He's attentive to our cries. He, he's with us in this brokenness. And he can help us through this. God works in brokenness to create families. And God works in the broken relationships between family members. It says in verse 27, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, this family is one of the most whole families that we're ever going to see in the Bible. The Bible has some ideals about what we should go for for as a family, but no families in the Bible live up to those ideals. And this family, it's like, hey, there's one wife, one husband. As far as I can see, like, there's no other women involved in this story, unlike almost every other story in the Old Testament, it seems like. And uh, then these two boys, like, neither one of them kill each other. It gets close, but they don't, you know, that, that's pretty amazing. So like this is, a, this is as model of a family as it gets, and yet there's brokenness in, in this family. And, and we see the brokenness here in, in the favoritism that's showed by the parents to the different boys. As, you know, the dad says, hey, I love the guy that goes out and hunts. That, that's my kind of guy. And mom's like, I love the guy that stays at home with the tents. That, that's my kind of guy. And, and I think that's terrible. Sometimes I'll talk to parents shocked, you know, that, that they will say, yeah, this is my favorite. This is the one I love, and these other ones, not as much. And, and I think, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. If you've done it, like, repent. Say you're sorry. Work on loving the others. Why? A couple of reasons. One, Jesus teaches us, the Bible teaches us, Jesus was reinforcing what the Old Testament says, that we're, we're called to love our enemies, if we're supposed to love our enemies, we, we've got to be able to love our children, even children that are a different personality than us. There's just selfishness in this. Isaac's basically loving himself, and Rebecca's loving herself. That, that is not the kind of love we're called to have as parents. We've we got to reach out to all of our children and, and love them, and then we're, we're supposed to love others as we would have them love us. Who wants to be that child that a mom or a dad says, yeah, I love your brother or sister more than you. Nobody wants to be that child. So don't make anybody else in your family that child. It just sows seeds of rivalry that uh, don't need to be sown. Like rivalry happens all by itself. When uh, we had only two children, Nathan and Janny, boy and a girl, we were living in Bellevue at a house outside the base. It was a, kind of a modest two-bedroom home on the main level. There's a third bedroom in the basement. It wasn't even legal. And uh, so we had the, you know, they were both together in one bedroom. We're just like right across this little hall and the bathroom in between us. And we're putting them down and trying to get them to sleep. Like, oh, whew, done, you know. And then the light comes back on and they're like out of bed. Like, no, I told you, you know. So we, we were pretty strict. I'd say we were kind of like spare the spoon, spoil the child kind of parenting structure. We had a Tupperware spoon that had some flex and a rounded bottom that was just fit for other rounded bottoms. And so, you, you know, we tried to instill like, no, you, you got to listen to us in, in this. And uh, Jannie, our daughter, just kept turning on the lights. Like she wouldn't listen, you know. I was like, well, 
how willful is this child to keep, you know, it's like, how many things does it take for? They'll, they'll learn to keep this off. And then one time I came in after the light was on and caught Nathan was talking to her, like telling her, you should do this. You should turn on the light. And I'm thinking like, he knows, like he's, he's way smart enough to know like, oh yeah, she's going to get it again. <laughs> so yeah, you don't have to sew this. Like this, this happens. Brokenness happens and it happens in these boys and it was sewn. So these, these boys, they, they don't love each other. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why it was also called Edom, or red. So this guy's hairy or red. You know, he's like, you can relate to uh, this guy. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. You see huge brokenness here between these two boys. First, looking at Jacob, like if your brother comes in and he's famished and you've got plenty of stew that you've made, you shouldn't even have to ask, right? You should offer it to him. He's your brother. It, if you think about the values of Middle Eastern hospitality, which, which are way higher than our values for hospitality, if, if he had been a stranger, if he'd never even met him before, and, and he showed up, and if there wasn't any stew ready, he would make stew to be able to share it with this stranger. But when his brother comes in, who he does know, he's like, no. You're not getting any stew unless you, what? Give me the most valuable thing you've got for one bowl of stew. Like, give me your birthright. So that shows you the the heart of the supplanter, this this conniving Jacob who is just cold towards his brother. And then Esau, talk about impulsive. I was listening to some research that was being reported on YOLO purchases. And I was like, what? you only live once purchases. These are like, well, you kind of say to yourself as you're looking at it, like, I probably don't need this. It's probably going to regret this. But, you know, you only live once. So it's like, I'm going to get it. And then you will regret it. This is the worst YOLO decision ever that, that Esau makes. He's like, what? You know, I'm starving. I'm, I'm going to die of hunger. Listen, newsflash. If you are able to walk in from the field and you're able to say to your brother, I'm dying. I'm going to starve of hunger you won't, right? You're not going to die of hunger. You have the energy reserves to make yourself some food. Like, you'll survive. But he's just like, no, I just want it right now, and I don't care what it is. So he despises his birthright, which is despising his culture. It's despising his family. It's despising God, the blessing that he has. And uh, super foolish. That's the brokenness in these boys. And he doesn't say thank you. It's just a a broken family. Jesus grew up, and I don't want to confuse you when I go to Jesus and these guys. I just just like to keep Jesus in the mix here. Jesus is way long time after uh, Isaac and these guys, about a couple thousand years. But Jesus, he had brokenness in the relationship between his brothers, his half-brothers, John chapter 7, it says that Jesus was in the area of Galilee and uh, he'd been in Judea doing work and the religious leaders were going to kill him because they're already on to him. They're like, man, we got to shut this guy down. And and so he's not going to go publicly to this feast that's coming up and his brothers are like, you should go. You should go to the feast. Why? Because you're, you know, you're, you want to be a big guy in Israel. You want to be like this big religious leader thing. You know, you should, you should head down there. Everybody that's a big person, big religious leader, heads down there. They don't care that Jesus is going to be killed. It says even his own brothers, they, they didn't believe in him. And Jesus was in this family. It couldn't be, couldn't be pleasant. You know, these guys tried to go get him put away. They're like, he's crazy. And, and yet Jesus stayed in this family and God worked with this family and God changed the hearts of these brothers so that after Jesus was resurrected, you know, one of these brothers becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And the other brother is also a leader and writes a letter that we have. And it seems like all the brothers became believers. 
And so uh, God works in the brokenness in relationships and families. And it's wonderful to see, but it's painful to experience the brokenness. And, and so, you know, hang in there, man. If you're a husband and wife that's like, man, you're feeling the brokenness, hang in there in that relationship. If you've got a brokenness between your parents and a child, you know, hang in there. And between brothers and sisters, that, that doesn't mean there, that you may not have to set boundaries. That, that, that doesn't mean that, that you have to go along with whatever they say. I mean, that, the brokenness can be so bad that sometimes you've got to get out to, to get, get the healing. Like, you, you've got to um, have some boundaries set. And again, th- this calls for discernment, but, but God can work, and it's a beautiful thing when you see God work. And some of you have seen that. Some of you, you know, maybe are yet waiting to see that. And then God blesses when we stay with the Lord in a broken world. I love this next section. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. So like this is, like I'm sure Isaac heard about that famine and now we got famine again. Like this is the land, this is the promised land. And famine, um, like we're in drought conditions in Iowa now. We're hoping the drought will be relieved, but drought is not famine. Drought after drought after drought, where there's no crops, where, where the animals are dying, where the people are dying because they can't get food. Communities are dispersing, going somewhere else to find food. That's famine. And so there's famine in the land. This is terrible. This is broken. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Why would he go down there? Because there's the Nile River flowing. There's Agriculture happened along that river, irrigation, there's food. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. So he's going to bless Isaac, he's going to bless these broken boys, he's going to bless the even more broken people that will come from them. I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So this is the original promise that Abraham got and was following. And now it's repeated to Isaac and he has this promise. And I found it interesting, I never noticed this before, but uh, I always identified with Abraham in chapter 12 that he's like, he left everything. Leave everything that's familiar to you and go to the land I will show you. I was like, wow. You know, when I'm going to seminary, I'm thinking like, oh, Abraham, like, I, I can relate to that. But I never noticed that for Isaac, it's a very different condition for the blessing. He says, hey, stay. Stay in this broken place. Stay in this famine-laden place. You, you just stay here. Don't go. Stay. And, and if you stay, I'll bless you. And, and I'll bless all the generations. The, the promise will be received by you staying. So Abraham gets it for going. Isaac gets it for staying. And how do you know when, when you're in the midst of brokenness, like should you stay or should you go? Well, you have to seek this blesser. You, you got to listen for his voice. You got to look to him to say like, you know, God, what do you have for me in this? And, and then trust him. And Abraham trusted him, and that's why this blessing is being passed on. Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. Now, this was before the Old Testament law was given to Moses. Abraham was not a perfect guy. Abraham did not follow all the laws. Abraham lied. Abraham was a little bit weird, and uh, yet Abraham trusted God at, at key points, and that's what was required. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Isaac trusted God at at this key point. And and we're called to trust God. And and because Isaac trusted God, we're blessed. But we're blessed because Jesus Christ came through him. Abraham might have fulfilled some righteous requirements of God, but uh, Jesus fulfilled all the righteous requirements of God. So we've got somebody that, that passes on this blessing to us. And Jesus, he obeyed the command to go, he left heaven to come into our brokenness and take it on himself, and, and he obeyed the command to stay. When God says, no, no, hang in there, stay, go through this suffering, go through the cross, 
and, and then everybody will be blessed. And so Jesus is on the cross, like in Matthew, it says he's on there for three hours from like noon till three o'clock, he's on the cross, and then he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And it's Aramaic for, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is feeling the, the brokenness, but he's also hinting at where his thoughts are taking him, and they're taking him to Psalm 22. Uh, I don't have time to read it today. Uh, you can read it, but Psalm 22 is written probably a thousand years after Isaac stays by David, who's going through a, a similar feeling of, wow, this is so broken, and yet he's hanging in there with the Lord, and, and it's anticipating David's writing words that are very descriptive of what Jesus is going through a thousand years later, and Jesus refers back to this psalm, and, and he takes us to this psalm, and this psalm it ends in a powerful way by this person that feels surrounded and abandoned. It says, All of the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. So like the very poor, the very wealthy, everybody's going to be worshiping this one. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Jesus did it for us. He, he hung in there. And he, he did it so that we could be blessed in this broken world. And Jesus is our hope for our broken world. He, he's our hope for our broken lives. He's our hope for our broken families. And the question is, you know, will we trust Jesus? Will we seek Jesus? Will we wait with Jesus in this brokenness? And if we will, he will do it. He'll bless us.